Well, those folks from 16 to 21 were, as the law said then, and now they were minors. M-I-N-O-R-S. Right? They were under the control of their fathers. Or if their fathers were deceased, they were under the control of their mothers. Or they might be apprentices or servants who were under the control of their masters or their mistresses. Those people generally didn't have any money. <coughs> you were an apprentice, you were getting room and board, and you were learning your trade. And you might get a few pence here and there, but they weren't giving you a salary for that. And if you were a minor child, probably the same thing if you were living on a farm somewhere. You didn't have any money. And if your mother was a widow, it's probably unlikely that she had much. Nonetheless, she was the one who would pay the fine if you didn't get the gun, if you were a minor. All right, so that's how women were tied into this. They had a financial responsibility to pay for their servants, apprentices, or minor children if they were the heads of the household. And they also had a process there called the watch and the ward, which is called neighborhood watch. Watch was at night, and the ward was during the day. They were assigned to people on a rotational basis the duty of being in the watch house or the watch tower or where, whatever it was to maintain that security. And every household typically had to provide someone to do that, a man. And you could buy a substitute, but if you were a household under a woman, then she was financially responsible for this. So they didn't make them perform the functions, but they might make them pay for it. So everyone had to be armed, and everyone had to be trained. And they had a regular schedule, depending on whether it was a period of warfare or otherwise, usually about four times a year, six times a year for the lowest level training, the company level training. And they would have field days for the battalions or the regiments, the larger entities. And that primarily was because they were expected to learn the maneuvers of the regular army. And if you've ever seen any uh, colonial period uh, reenactors, they're rather intricate. Everybody has to march with the same step and at the same rate and so forth and so on, or the formations break up. And those formations were absolutely necessary for the kind of fighting that they were doing. That's the way they were trained, unless you were fighting the Indians, which was another story entirely. But they were trained to be able to cooperate with the British Army. And the British Army used those so-called linear, linear tactics. And they would come out for, as I say, four, six, or more times a year, depending on the circumstances, to be trained. And then they were subject, <coughs> for every dereliction, to the payment of some kind of monetary fine. And this was primarily the way that they financed themselves. Because it was the way that people could get a really short-term exemption, if you will. I don't want to show up for this all day, the six shillings or whatever it was. Now that brings me to the fact that they had long-term exemptions. They had a society that was relatively small in population compared to the threat that they had to face. So they exempted very few people from this requirement of service. They saw two categories, public office and certain kinds of private occupations. In the public office, people like the governor, governor's council, members of the legislature, uh, constable, sheriffs, they ran down some of these offices, uh, and judges in the courts. Now, this was an exemption really that removed those people from the necessity for showing up for the regular training. You find in many statutes they had to maintain firearms themselves, or sometimes they had to buy firearms for others. And if you were the governor and in the council, you were probably the high officers of the militia anyway, so were many members of the legislature. So their requirement was not to be out of the militia, but not to perform certain functions because of these public offices. And then there were some private occupations that were considered so vital that they were given exemptions. Physicians, for instance, were given exemptions physicians and surgeons, which in a sense, in the long run, was meaningless because if the militia was ever called out, these people would go along. They just didn't have to show up for the regular training because they weren't ones who were carrying guns and having to learn these, these tactical evolutions. Ministers had exemption. Men of the cloth, right? Churchmen. But who was the man who showed up, the first man who showed up with a gun in Concord on the 19th of April, 1975? He's a town minister. Right. That was another one of these exemptions. It was not a prohibition. It was a license to remove yourself. 
ferrymen and millers were always exempted. Why? Well, the man who ran the ferry was critical of the transportation network. And he might have been the only one who knew how to do it. Had to have him there. And the miller, well, these towns, and most militia were organized on the basis of towns or, or counties, they were primarily agricultural. They're growing grain and have it milled. This was the man that did that. Well, the family that did that, many of them. And so he was vital to the maintenance of the economic structure. So the only people they let out at all from the primary functions of training were the ones that had a vital function for the economy or for the political structure. Now, if you translate that kind of organization into our modern context, what would you change? Well, primarily nothing. <clears throat> you'd organize it essentially the same way because you'd want to maintain the political basis of this structure. You want a bottom-up rather than top-down structure. If you think about the way those militias were organized, they were highly democratic. Everyone was in them. Elitism was not something that, that ruled that kind of an organization. So they were highly egalitarian as well. In fact, most officers, at the lower levels at least, were elected by the men. And it's interesting to see some of these militia statutes change over the years. I remember one sequence. I can't remember what state it was from. They've been from New Jersey. And the first thing they say is, that no one is allowed to uh, bring liquor to the militia uh, assemblies. They don't want the men drunk. And next it was, they couldn't hold a militia assembly within a mile of a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> because you might not bring your own liquor, but it was the tavern. And the next one, a few years later, was you couldn't hold a militia assembly within five miles of a tavern. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently there were people who were willing to walk that extra <laughs> And then they come up with one that says that the officers are not allowed to treat the enlisted men with liquor. Well, they were treating the enlisted men to get the enlisted men's votes. Because that's how they were elected. Highly, that was just like an American election today. <laughs> a highly democratic organization in that sense. It included everybody. Their situation probably would not have included as many homeland security threats as we see, even some of the paranoid threats of international terror, primarily because they were a self-sustaining agricultural society in most instances. So they would not have had to worry about, say, food security. They probably weren't too worried about vote fraud because they didn't have electronic voting machines. If you went to a town meeting, everybody put his hand up. You knew what the vote count was. In fact, you knew who voted for what. No question about it. They did have the same kind of, perhaps not as extensive, police problems with crime. They probably didn't have what we would call an immigration problem because they were looking for immigrants as much as possible. Although there were some Im immigrants they wanted to keep out, particularly the French and the Indians aligned with the French. Well, they didn't have it from that perspective. And they had a society with far fewer, oh, or should have put the other way, they had a society with a much less developed division of labor. We have more people with more skills than they could have imagined, I think. So that would mean that in the present day, you would probably be able to grant a much larger range of exemptions to most people because we probably have 10 or 20 times as many people as we need to perform the basic function. It will allow people to have lots of exemptions. And because we have highly specialized individuals, we could break up our militia structures and specialize them, much more so than those militia structures were offered. I mean, they had artillery, they had cavalry, they had infantry, but they were basically broken down on military type as opposed to other kinds of functions. So you could imagine engineering groups, you could imagine medical response, all sorts of things you could imagine today, which they would have not had the luxury of breaking up their organization because they wouldn't have had enough skilled people to create separate units of this kind. And then that would have taken away from the units over here in which they needed the, the number of rifles or the number of bayonets or whatever to perform their basic, basic function. All right, so that's the basic concept that I looked through here in the Constitution. So we don't have this. We don't have this for a couple of reasons. And number one 